Good afternoon, and welcome to this special event during Edmonton's Sexual Exploitation Awareness Week. My name is Kate Quinn, and I'll be your MC for the day. I'm the co-chair of the Sexual Exploitation Working Group. It's a leadership group in Edmonton uh, that uh, strives to bring the community together throughout the year in different ways to learn about different aspects of sexual exploitation and sex trafficking in our community. Every year for the last 15 years, we have asked our mayor of the day to declare a week of awareness because we think it's important to keep these issues and their complexities before the public uh, arena. So on Monday, we began with a proclamation at the CBC stage, and you can see and read the proclamation later. I would like to begin by respectfully remembering that we are on Treaty 6 land and that we walk together and share this land with those whose ancestors were among the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Nakota Sioux, the Métis people, and there are also Inuit people in Edmonton. As those of us who came from other lands, uh, we, we commit ourselves to work together to heal historic injustices and present injustices and commit ourselves to walking this healing path of truth and reconciliation. I would like to uh, introduce, uh, I'd like to tell you who's here from the, the Sexual Exploitation Working Group. We, uh, not all of our members are here, but we, uh, the group is composed of ACT Alberta, Bent Arrow, Traditional Healing Society, CEAST, Center to End All Sexual Exploitation, Edmonton Region Child and Family Services, Protection of Sexually Exploited Children Team, City of Edmonton, the Edmonton Fetal Alcohol Network, Edmonton Police Service Human Trafficking and Exploitation Unit, REACH Edmonton, Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton, and the Family Center. And we link out to uh, all different networks within the community. REACH is our backbone organization, the Council for Safe Communities, and they provide the services of Trevor and Clayton with the Collaborative Media Group. That's what enables us to bring this to some of you who are watching live stream from your office desks or your home. And uh, the video then will be up on the REACH website in about a month or so. You might wonder why I'm wearing orange and why the orange up here and some of our members are wearing orange. Orange is a color that's been chosen by many anti-human trafficking groups around the world. It brings together the, the red, which is both passion and anger at injustice, and yellow, which is the warmth and compassion of the sun. It all comes together in orange, and there's many shades of orange. So we have chosen this color uh, to wear throughout the week. The uh, high-level bridge was lit up orange, and we, we invite you all to uh, maybe wear orange tomorrow. Before you, you see a vase with orange flowers. And these flowers symbolize the more than 50 people who are known to have been murder victims uh, uh, throughout the years in Edmonton. Sadly, only 11 of those murders have been solved. We also remember those who have lost their lives through suicide, addictions, mental health challenges and physical uh, illnesses as a result of lives of uh, being exploited or homeless or uh, challenged in any way. We believe it's really important to carry the memory within our hearts and within our public spaces so that we're motivated as a whole community to end what is hurting people and what is killing people. Friday, we will have a session with, uh, it's called Coffee with the Cops at the Kingsway McDonald's. So if any of you would like to come, I believe it starts around nine o'clock. It'll be good, good conversation. So why this topic? This past year, we've had several lunch and learns and we've used the tagline, pathways in and out of sexual exploitation. We did one on housing. We did one on fetal alcohol effect. We did one on mental health and addictions. And now we're talking about a really tough and touchy subject. Uh, the big words, pornography. Another word might be the impact of viewing online sexually violent and degrading images. And we're going to unpack that uh, with Dr. Corey Rushka. But, but why the topic? 
Part of my work is that I facilitate the sex trade offender program. And since 2015, we've been asking men who come, when's the first uh, age that you viewed porn? How often do you view? Do you view soft? Do you view hard? Do you core? Do you view violent porn? We want to understand the link that viewing uh, degrading and sexually violent images has on and as a driver for sexual exploitation and the sex trade. We also are very concerned about our children and youth. I was up in Lac La Biche a couple months ago uh, presenting and I heard one mother from one of the nearby First Nations saying, we're really concerned about our eight-year-olds eight viewing pornography. What do we do about that? Uh, this was an article that was in the Edmonton Journal May 11th. Sex trafficking, porn charges, and porn charges laid against pair. A 24-year-old and 25-year-old uh, man and woman were exploiting very vulnerable 15 and 16-year-olds, and they were charged with uh, two counts of making child pornography. So these are some of the reasons why we wanted to talk about that. We, you will learn about the impacts of viewing, and uh, we at the Sexual Exploitation Working Group are also concerned about the dynamics of making pornography, and where might there be elements of exploitation, harm, and human trafficking. So it is this complex. There's not a lot of easy answers, but I think that uh, by cracking it open and inviting uh, Corey Rushka to speak with us today, we'll, we'll take that journey. You'll notice that there's white slips of paper scattered about. We invite you to write down any of your questions. At the end, we will, uh, you know, we will collect the questions, and then I'll read them out, and Corey will do his best to respond. So Corey. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Corey for well over 15 years. He was a presenter at the Sex Trade Offender Program. He is the uh, senior psychologist and CEO of Insight Psychological. Uh, he's a certified sex therapist, I believe the first one in Edmonton, but because he's also a supervisor and a trainer, there are now several other certified sex therapists. Okay, one more. So, uh, and they're one more to come, and they're very, very busy. Also, helping people look at what it means to be in healthy relationships. So, I would like to uh, now welcome Corey to walk us through pathways in and out of sexual exploitation, the impact of high use pornography and cyber sex. Thank you, Corey. Okay, how's the sound for that? Is this good? Okay, so um, let's start off. So I, I just want to start out with a disclaimer, and I think as time goes on, I need to add this disclaimer more and more because I keep talking more and more about sex. Um, and I think one of the things I want to just let people know is um, that way we, we will be d discussing intimate topics, and so I want you to be aware of that, that see how they apply to your circumstances. Uh, I think in my experience and most of my clients, Everyone has been impacted or touched by porn in some way. If they, they don't know someone, they've, they've seen it, they've watched it, they know about it. Um, it's pretty prevalent. And so um, everyone may have a different experience with it as well. So just I want you to be aware of that. Um, I want to create a safe space where everyone can feel comfortable to ask the questions. Uh, for the questions that you guys have, I encourage you to write down anything goes in, in terms of my mind. I might not be able to answer it. I will attempt to. Um, and so I also want to uh, create an environment where people feel included, respected, and able to express themselves openly and honest and ask those questions. Um, now, because of some of the research and some of the general patterns, there are some things that I want to comment on, and generalizations will be occurring. Um, these patterns are commonly seen in terms of what I call is like gender patterns. So lots of the research will say is males and females. Um, they may not include uh, trans individuals in terms of the research if they were even known. Um, there are some gender patterns, and when I look at that, I think of look at masculinity and femininity on a continuum. And so a lot of the research, what I'm seeing and application applies to more like how masculinized or how feminized your brain is in each one of the different traits that you may have going on. So as that lens, just keep that in the back of your head or your mind as we kind of go through that. Because um, also some of the research just comments on gender-based um, stuff. Um, a lot of it is bioevolutionary um, components related to this. 
I don't want to spend too much time on me. Um, I'm now no longer the only certified sex therapist. Uh, Jason, one of my students, or a psychologist, is now certified, and he's also a sex therapy supervisor. So I am the only diplomat, though, still in Edmonton, at least. I think there's only two in Alberta. Um, so yeah, hopefully I know what I'm talking about after doing this for about 25 years, 26, 27. I've lost track now. Um, so there's a whole bunch of other little certifications. I like chasing papers, so if you're really interested, you can ask me about them. Um, I've been on newspapers and TV and stuff like that too regarding sex, um, usually in sex and violence. So that's just saying, okay, a little bit about me, but let's get to the fun stuff. So uh, a little bit of overview. I want to talk a little bit about stats on usage rates, influences, some of the reasons um, why people get involved in porn or what's attached to it, the effects it has on brain behavior, um, a little bit about what's that draw about, which is the novelty effect, uh, some of the side effects that can occur from that or potential side effects, um, in issues involving teens and youth, um, some of the psychological and legal risks attached to that, a little bit of the positives, because technically there are positives, and I, I want to be able to claim when we're talking about porn, and I guess I'll start off defining that a little bit as soon as I finish this, um, because it's a wide range, and I want to be really kind of clear about that, because it's still not fully clear. And then what we can do about it if it becomes a problem, and there's some resources for you guys, too. So... Um, let's, I'm going to start off by ta defi defining porn. I, I don't know if there's still a really adequate definition of porn because I have individuals and you know dictionary definitions will include anything that is used, written, and or visual that is used for sexual arousal or causes sexual arousal is viewed as porn from one lens, which can include sexual education material, any uh, romance novels, anything like that, to kind of, I would say, the more common Definition would be explicit penetration, uh, you know, in terms of sexual material. Um, so there is a hook. We know there's a big hook. Uh, I want to explain a little bit about why there is a hook or what's it about. So the, the key components, I'd say, is uh, there's what's called intoxicating, isolating, inexpensive, interactive, and the internet, which means it's everywhere or potentially everywhere as long as you have internet access. Um, and that's more now. In the past, typically it would have been through vi magazines or VHS videos. Interesting note, uh, anyone know why um, uh, there was VHS and what was the other one? Beta? Do you, know, do you know why beta went down? They refused to do porn. That's uh, the main reason why beta did not make it because VHS said, we're good with it, we'll make it and skyrocketed sales. It's, in it's intoxicating because of uh, this physiological response it can give. It's isolating because you can do it in the basement, anywhere, by yourself. Um, it's cheap. Right now, it's, it's free. You can, I mean, you can pay for it if you really want to, but Pornhub is free. Lots of the websites there are free, and you know, I assume they make their money off of the marketing um, because sex still sells very well. Um, it's interactive. It can be very interactive. When I talk about cyber sex, um, that can be any of that sexual activity that's involved online, which can be interactive uh, webcam girls. Um, there are interactive programs that you can now do. Um, it, it can involve asking people to do something on the video while you know while you're watching, versus just standard videos and/or pictures. Um, I kind of equate it when I talk to people about what the effect is or how it's similar to it's the never-ending buffet for my foodies out there. Uh, the never-ending buffet of high-quality gourmet food delivered to your door 24 hours a day, free of charge, and immediate demand without getting really full from it. Because one of the things that dopamine, is, which is one of the chemicals I'll be talking about, is it doesn't you don't really get full on it. You can you can satiate, which just makes you want more later on or very quickly. Um, and the other thing is when we're looking at sex and food, it's, it's even, my mind, more powerful than food because uh, from a dopamine surge, food tends to have what I found is about a 200% dopamine spike and sex gives you a 250% dopamine spike. Now, when you look at other drugs, for instance, amphetamines give you about a 1,000% dopamine spike and methamphetamines about a 1,200% dopamine spike. And so with that dopamine, you can see how uh, the effect people can have on it because it becomes very 
very powerful and uh, uh, and the impulse control to kind of do it it keeps going up as you kind of get used to it I just looked at the stats and it was actually quite interesting so right now um, the main topic of this is high porn use. The majority of the population are not high porn users, but I, I think that keeps changing as time goes on, is how do we define high? Um, uh, the majority of the individuals using porn are non-problematic users, but I'm still pretty busy with seeing problematic users and the effects. Even if it's not a problematic use, the impact it has on relationships, behavior, workplace, stuff like that too. Um, so right now, um, Sonia Thompson, who who I know from a long time ago, did some research on uh, in 20, 2003, and she pulled 425 students in grade eight across Alberta, and basically at that time, which was much slower internet, much less sophisticated kind of porn usage stuff, 80% of the boys and 72% of the girls, they had been sexually explicit content online, and 30%, 35% of the boys said they had seen more porn too many times to count. And that's for your grade eighters. My son, who's grade eight, um, I was asking him a little bit about this, and he was saying, right now in class, a bunch of his students, mostly his male students, are not only watching porn at school, they're watching it in class on their cell phones. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been studied since, so we don't know the update on if the numbers have gone up, gone down, or stayed the same. Uh, this is the other interesting number. It's like... Pornhub, which is just one porn website, it's one of the main ones, based in Montreal, 33.5 billion over 2018, an increase in 5 billion visits from 2017. That equates to basically a daily average of 92 million visitors um, at that time of the writing in 2018. Um, right now, at that time, it was exceeding 100 million um, daily visits. That's basically the equivalent of combining Canada, Poland, and Australia's population, all watching porn now. Um, some other stats include one in five searches are related to porn on smartphones, which is on the rise. And uh, from a gender pattern, men are m more porn users uh, than women. Women tend to like the romance novels and or material um, more and reading material more than men. There is some, actually some bioevolutionary dynamics to men's visual uh, arousal patterns, which I'll kind of talk a little bit to. So, what does this high involve? I call it the chemical cocktail. And most of the reading that I've done only seems to give me two or three of the chemicals at one time. And so after reading everyone's, well, not everyone's, but a lot of the people who are doing research in the area, this is my most comprehensive list of things that I know um, is being released in regards to sexual behavior, but really it's in the porn use too. They, they almost mimic each other from the, from the research that I'm finding. So we have adrenaline or epinephrine and, and noradrenaline. So these are kind of that, that arousal. It's a physiological arousal. It's your adrenaline kind of stuff. My dopamine. So dopamine, um, like I said, it's, that, it's the feel good, want to do it again chemical is what I call it. Um, one of the side effects of dopamine is over long-term use, it increases frontal lobe impairment, which basically makes you more impulsive to chase anything that gives you that dopamine hit. And so the more you do that again, the more impulsive it is, the more desire to kind of go chase it again. Repeat, repeat, and that's where you get that increase. Um, dopamine is even released thinking about something that you might want to do again that you've liked in the past. And so that's where you get this. It's not even during it. It's before it all starts. As soon as you start thinking about it and anticipating it, you're getting a dopamine spike, which reinforces the whole pattern. Um, which is what is also related to acquiring new behavior. Um, <laughs> Now, one of the interesting things about dopamine is uh, there's no really good understanding, but I'd say is the best research that I'm saying seems to show that, and in my experience in practice, it takes about four weeks, four to six weeks to about four months, depending on how much dopamine you're getting in your system, to counterbalance it in your brain so you're not being hooked in by it. And so when I'm working with my clients, um, I'm trying to get them to my magic six-week mark to see how they are in terms of being able to manage their behavior. 
uh, it has gone up to one year in terms of some of the research for my really high dopamine users uh, in terms of be it drugs or out you know your meth users or frequent kind of porn stuff um, now in the orgasm stage we get this the nice big cocktail and this is uh, we'll start with serotonin so serotonin is um, one of the neurotransmitters that you'll see on all of the SSRIs. So any of the antidepressants, one of the interesting side effect of the antidepressant is to elevate mood, and it also frequently will kill sex drive or sex functioning to some degree. Each medication in the SSRI categories has a little different effect. Um, so it's a mood elevator, a libido decreaser after the fact. Um, and basically, as decreases in dopamine or in um, serotonin go, you might get more increases in mounting and impulsivity. So there is a relationship to sexuality with even uh, serotonin here. Um, vasopressin uh, is our monogamy uh, molecule, they'll call it. So basically, once you get your vasopressin um, hit, you want to pair bond with whatever you were watching or connecting with or having an orgasm to. So um, there's an, if you're interesting, there's a, the prairie vole. They did a study on a prairie vole where they uh, you know, gave an injection to a vasopressin to one and stopped it in the other. And the cheating prairie vole stopped cheating and became monogamous. And the monogamous prairie vole became a cheating you know, prairie vole only by changing vasopressin responses. Um, endorphins. Now, endorphins are a natural opiate. And so uh, in terms of when you're looking at from a, an addiction model, typically that endorphin starts to mm, crave again after about two, three days. Um, and, in my ex and some of this research will say is it takes about uh, seven to 10 days to get out of the withdrawal component. And endorphins, uh, that's your runner's high. Um, it's also the most common one that makes you feel ah, a relaxed, kind of mellow experience. Um, after an orgasm. Um, so we also have oxytocin. So this is the other interesting one. Um, oxytocin is our, it's similar to vasopressin in a way, but it's the bonding chemical. Um, and the bonding chemical basically gets released. And so wh whatever you're looking at during an orgasm response, you are psychologically bonding to. Um, and so that also gives that feelings of contentment, the reductions in anxiety, the calmness, and the feelings of security. Now, there's an interesting research that women who are, you, you can induce oxytocin through touch, kissing. Women kind of release it during eye contact and talking. Um, and there's some saying that men don't really. Uh, there's some research saying that estrogen in women magnifies the effect of uh, oxytocin and testosterone suppresses the effect, even though we kind of have the same levels. Um, so it gets kind of interesting. But that would be kind of the main chemical cocktail. So just think after watching porn and or you know, having an orgasm, this surge goes through your system. And so what I'll find a lot of with my, my problematic porn users is I kind of laugh because I'll say that you know, they, can, they can handle it. Oh, let's, let's go for our 30 days. So, yeah, no problem. And they last two or three days. And they're usually going through that first stage of you know, physiological or psychological withdrawal, depending on how much they're doing. If you're not using it a lot, you won't see that withdrawal feeling. Um, and some people, everyone's biology is a little bit different. So some individuals tend to be a lot more susceptible to it. Now we're going to complicate this a little bit more by adding on uh, the novelty, I call it a novelty effect, and the Coolidge effect. So it's this. Uh, bigger, fa bigger, better, faster, stronger mindset that you're seeing a lot more now. Um, and so the, the impact of higher porn use, particularly in men, is somewhat backed by what's called the Coolidge effect. And the Coolidge effect is a bioevolutionary phenomenon seen primarily in animals. And so what they've found is if you, if you put a bull in a pen with a cow, the frequency of sex will start high and then it'll go down. If you put that same bull, even after they've had sex with the, you know, the cow a few times, into a herd of cattle, the sex drive does not go down. It stays high, consistent, as long as uh, that bull has access to those cows. And so this is mimicking what you'll see in relationships, interestingly, where uh, in, in a majority of the dynamics, sex drive tends to go down in the same paired relationship. 
But if you look at adding porn to that, their sex drive does not go down. Their sexual activity with the single partner may, may, not always. Um, but it's not as commonly seen with women. Um, also, the things that are more, anything that's more novel or taboo, these are the things that give you that dopamine high a little bit more, so you get that higher desire to go chase something that's new, novel, and different. And so that increases that likelihood to say, as we're starting off, let's say, from a porn lens of starting off with the, uh, the swimsuit magazine, because you're going to get a little bit of a dopamine hit from that, and that's going to fatigue, so you need something more stronger, more powerful to kind of get that. So you might be looking to a soft core, which then can lead to hardcore use, which can lead to, if you kind of fatigue that one out, um, violence and or non-consensual, anything that's going to give that that adrenaline, that, that kind of more excitement, high novelty stuff. Uh, you could do it as simple as just changing hair color and then you kind of get that same pattern, but once you've gone through hair color and other, other dynamics, usually you're looking for something new and different that you haven't seen before. And sometimes I call it going down the rabbit hole because it can get quite interesting where people end up, which can include youth um, and more extreme sexual behaviors. <coughs> going to comment on that, but it's disappeared. Now, speaking kind of about gender perceptions too, what's kind of interesting is there is a difference between how men and women experience and process porn in a relationship overall. Um, not just as viewers, but how men and women react to their partners viewing. So as a general, again, generalization, um, men tend to not see it as an issue. It's their personal private behavior that is not related necessarily to the relationship in their mind. Um, women tend to personalize porn use a lot more often. Um, men tend to respond to the visual versus women and the relational aspect of sexual porn. Um, women also tend to be more likely to be okay if just sex happens if an affair occurs rather than if they've fallen in love, which is inversely dynamic of men being more okay if the intimacy and love occurred as long as the sex did not happen with another person during an affair. Um, again, remember these are tendencies. Just little tidbits that I... I could keep talking about this all day, but I'm trying to crunch this all into an hour for you guys. Um, the other thing I want to look at is correlation versus causation. Like the effects on brain and behavior. So rem remember that porn does not cause anything that I actually know of. Is it correlated to lots of different behavior? Yes. So correlated means there's some form of relationship to it. It's an influencer, um, but it does not cause. So that's why when I'm trying to communicate language patterns to people to make sure that no, porn did not cause your affair. Porn did not cause them to, you know, it, yes, it was a factor in it. Yes, it likely influenced it, but it's not a causal component. What it has been related to is increases in impulsivity and attention. Um, as you get into it, again, remember looking at the higher the porn use, the higher the correlation that you're going to see this uh, related to this. Increase in objectification of others, uh, lowered self-esteem due to self-perception. There are some interesting porn out there in terms of body image, not only for men, but for women. Um, mood and anxiety issues. Um, I, now I'm curious as how much of these mood and anxiety issues are related to secondary effects from this too, right? So. If you're hiding in your basement, not dealing with anyone, you know, and now you're wondering why you're depressed because you're not actually getting exercise, you're not socializing with anyone, um, uh, and this can, these, uh, yeah, and these issues can increase the likelihood or lead to problematic abuse, um, as in, as I mentioned. Now, if you take some of the stuff, uh, I'll take one of the case studies I have of, uh, you know, a family abuse situation where, you know, I've had clients. I think I was mentioning to, to someone here uh, the range of porn use or masturbation experience that I work with. I'll, I have clients that will do it, well, anywhere from none, or, you know, they've looked at it, maybe they've done it once or something like that, to my higher end um, clients where they'll do it 40 hours a week in terms of porn or cyber sex usage, or I've had a client who uh, would masturbate 30 times a day while he was working full time. So that that's a lot of time um, and involvement. So 
But as that happens, you get that increase in impulsivity or that desire. And so you start to also not think about the consequences, which is one of those dopamine responses. You're thinking about what's right here and right in front of you. You'll see that's with gambling, by the way, releases dopamine, shopping releases dopamine, all those kind of stuff. So while it's in front of you, you don't think about the consequences. You're not worried about it. It's just, I want that. I want it right now. And all I'm going to do is grab it or get it or do something about that. And so in terms of family members, this, that can lead to abuse of young children, other family members, um, uh, uh, you know, either a strong desire or demand that you know, sex is required in the relationship. So those are the, some of the things that I have seen or can see. Um, a little bit more effects on the brain and behavior. Uh, kind of reviewing some of the studies, about 35, over 35 studies. Basically, it has found in consistence, um, consistent with escalation of porn use and tolerance, habituation to porn, and even withdrawal symptoms. So that's that. The more porn you use, the higher likelihood you're going to satiate against it, and the more increased need or want to get bigger, better, faster, stronger. Um, and when you stop, then you'll see those um, withdrawal symptoms start to show themselves. So start to show themselves, which typically could look like irritability, anger. Um, uh, trying to chase and get something in terms of the, you know, usually the porn. Um, uh, there is strong support. So again, uh, and these are kind of labels that uh, the professionals in the field are kind of playing with. There still technically is not what we would call as a porn addiction. Everyone likes to use that term porn addiction. It's more like a kind of a, a lay term for a kind of society. However, we usually call it out of control sexual behavior um, because we're not actually addicted or to something that's not naturally already in her body. Um, so what we do is, interestingly though, the brain does respond like it's an addiction model. So your brain looks almost the same as if you're addicted, except there's no substance that you're ingesting to kind of get on, you know, get out of. Um, there also was interesting stuff in terms of consumption was associated with a sexual aggression. So that's in the United States and internationally. Um, in both males and females, um, both in cross and longitudinal studies. Um, and it was more verbal aggression, and that could be that irritation, frustration, stuff like that, rather than sexual um, aggression, though both were significant. Um, and, uh, and I think this is similar to research, I think, 25 years ago when I looked at is that, for instance, the violent porn content increases the likelihood in a percentage of the population to act out more. Uh, I think that's no different than aggression and violent movies. There's a percentage of the population who are a lot more susceptible to that. So they watch violent um, movies, they behave a lot more violently, where the majority of the population can go watch an action flick with violence and they're not going to kind of get angry, freak out. And um, potential sexual side effects um, and relational side effects. So there is, I've seen this quite a bit actually, um, porn-induced um, ED. So this is, in, this is where a case where someone who is kind of, usually I say they start at 13, that's when I usually start seeing them watch a lot of porn and they're not dating, they're not doing anything, they're not interacting with someone else and they watch it daily. And by the time they get to dating age, which could be even in that year as they get older, their brain has been hardwired to that porn dynamic. They're not sure what to do in a relationship sexually and the performance dynamics go up enough that they become anxious and they can't actually maintain an erection um, due to performance anxiety issues and or a templated pattern that they have hardwired quite strongly into their brain um, regarding what kind of porn that they were using. I've had come some cases where um, the, the pattern of behavior that they have learned or trained their brain to respond to was so restrictive that no person could be involved in it. It, would, it needed to be with a particular sheet, with a particular object, like a pillow, in a particular position, in a particular way, <laughs> and you can't put a person in there. And so we have to cross train them out of these patterns because they've learned that thousands and thousands of times sometimes before they get into a relationship. Um, PE. Um, and that's related to premature ejaculation. Sometimes if there's not enough experience or confidence in terms of a relationship, people get anxious in the relationship as it approaches sexuality. Um, and so you'll see PE rates will also go up that I've seen, and that's that anxiety and that performance anxiety issues. Um, again, we talked about increases in impulsivity, um, and that's to do something, in, not just in the porn area, but it can be just overall impulsivity issues. 
Um, I probably spend a good chunk of my time looking at relational breach, which can include uh, affairs, online connections without consent or transparency. So I spend a lot of time looking at consent and boundaries and, and relationship navigation, um, because as that impulsivity goes up, and or there's a, you know, the Coolidge effect occurs in, in a relationship, um, individuals w will go out of the relationship or try to seek something that's outside of the consent of the relationship. And so from a statistical perspective, actually the men and women from a, from a relational breach are not significantly different. I believe it's 48% for women and about 52% of men in their lifetime of relationship will, will breach it. Um, Insecurity, I'll see that mostly with my women in terms of the relationship. So higher levels of insecurity, the more porn use tends to get uh, used. Um, and then we have the withdrawal. So I have seen some interesting withdrawal reactions um, from individuals trying to come off of high porn use. Um, and again, that's craving, that's running around, that's, you know, they'll hold good for a little bit of time and then they might pass that two week mark or three week mark and then they hit that the one month mark and then that's that's their tolerance level so we're trying to help strengthen that internal system again to kind of counterbalance so, uh, individuals also have a history of uh, sexual abuse and I'll talk a little bit of stats about that too so if there's been you know that porn use or anything you see on the video um, you have an increase in triggering other personal issues from their past even if it's consensual behavior and, and agreed upon in the relationship it can still trigger old unresolved emotional issues um, more side effects, uh, the avoidance of interactions. Um, some people feel guilty for doing it. Um, and so that guilt leads them to not want to deal with people if they're going to ask about it. So it's just better to be safe and, than sorry. So they continue to do the behavior in the privacy of their own home or wherever. Um, and it also increases the likelihood of them want to stay in that because it's comfortable and safe. And then they get hypersensitized to dealing with people and it, it leads to, down that, that, that pattern. Um, as we talked earlier about that desire to kind of keep getting that chase, it also increases likelihood to use more. So once you start, it increases the likelihood of wanting more and more once you cross that threshold where your brain starts to crave it. And then increases in substance use and suicidality if it comes out of control. So a lot of people, it becomes out of control behavior. They're not happy with themselves. They don't know what to do. The relationship's in struggle, so they try to self-medicating or self-numbing, so they increase their substance use to try to co cope with that or numb it, which increases more problems, and then we get this snowball effect that kind of happens as well. Um, but that's, that's some of the kind of snowball effects that I'll see with high porn use. If we look at teens and youngsters, um, the young youth, uh, I think there's a quote that I kind of found where, you know, before it became an out of control behavior, there was that belief about himself that you almost feel like a little bit of a craving, but at first you think it's curiosity, not that craving. And so if you're just exploring and being curious about it because all your friends are doing it, then that's that kind of beginning stage where it can start to get a hold, um, especially in my more impulsive adolescents who are still exploring it and having that high hormonal surge. Because um, our brains develop continuing until about our mid-20s. Um, and so that, that time is when we're looking at what are you looking, because that's the stuff that's going to be kind of partially hardwired into, we call them arousal templates. Your sexual arousal templates are hardwired to some degree by what you're watching. Um, again, many youths are watching this a lot more now and a lot younger. Uh, Kate mentioned, I think you said it was 10 years old. I got individuals down to about five who, are, who have been forced to watch it, to be part of it, um, or have accidentally watched it because it's right there on the screen that their brother and or father uh, usually are kind of watching it. So they're, it's, it's part of their environment. Um, and again, the more that happens, the more there's a curiosity or there's, uh, or, a, or an arousal or an unknown. In my youngsters that age, I don't see that strong kick, but it becomes just a normal part. And by the time they hit their brother's age, whatever that might be, then it becomes, it's just part of the family system in terms of what's being used and watched. Media actually relates, I mean, not as powerful, but a lot of the uh, 
media that you know, the kids are watching in terms of iPhones, computers, stuff like that, uh, that affects their brains as well. And so you get a lot of these similar patterns because your little cell phone ding and that uh, gives you a dopamine high, a little bit of that hit. So that's that Facebook, all those kind of things are dopamine related commonly. A um, little bit more for adolescents because we talked a little bit about the adult stuff, but for adolescents who use porn, um, again, more higher porn use, then you get um, lower degrees of social integration, higher conduct problems. You can see how that might relate to impulsivity. Um, again, it's a correlation. They could also come from fa problem families. They're coping. And this is just one of those factors. So it's really kind of important to look at all of these. Uh, higher levels of delinquent behavior, incidences of depression, emotional bonding with caregivers it goes down as well. Um, my hunches from that would be because there's more emotional bonding with the porn that's more arousing. Or you're guilty and feeling that you're not comfortable enough to kind of talk about it, which pulls, it or pulls people away too. Um, there are legal risks attached to this too. So in terms of the legal risk, I have, a, like I said, a high number of cases um, where they've engaged in family or underage siblings due to impulse control related to porn use, um, which can exacerbate impulse control disorder. So if you have a kid who has ADHD, they're already at a higher likelihood for this impulsivity. And some of the kids that I have where they have that ADHD, they're watching a lot of porn. Now, not only do we have impulsive issues, we have high pleasure-oriented activities that are just adding to this pattern, which increases the likelihood of acting out. Um, and I've, I've had some teens who, yeah, like, you know, it's, it's not controllable, which means it has to be banned. All the material has to be locked down because even when they know it and they know they're going to get legally in trouble if they do it because it's been court-ordered five minutes into this, and it's like, 13 year old, 14 year old boys uh, that I'm dealing with where you put the phone down, they will hunt it down, hide it and go straight to porn uh, over anything else. Um, the other one that I see or have seen, not literally, um, is kind of, you know, the taking pictures of themselves and then sending it to uh, their girlfriend, boyfriend or the other friends who may also send it off to their friends depending on how, what's going on, whether there's, you know, um, consent or non-consensual activity. So technically from a legal perspective, that is production and distribution of child pornography. Um, especially if you're giving it to a minor, then that's not only giving it production and distribution, you're giving it to a minor. And so I've had uh, cases where, uh, you know, my 17-year-old boy takes a picture, like a dick pic, sends it to his girlfriend, who is 17, and then a year later it all comes out because it got through the internet and it got sent out. It's because of it's him. Now he's suffering charges because of that, even though at the age he was under the age of 18, now he's charged as an adult for production and distribution of child pornography because the distribution was occurring. Um, adults can also do this you know, or get into trouble with this too. Um, Stats Canada, there's about one in three girls, one in six boys are sexually abused in some way in their lifetime. Um, and in my experience, the porn use increases that likelihood for those rates to kind of occur. Um, I think Kate was also even talking about a ransomware. She was talking with me a little bit of a ransomware case that she's even experienced. <laughs> you know, the little pop-ups and stuff like that, access. You go, sure, that'll look like that. They get access to your computer and says, you've been looking at porn, and if you don't pay us money, we'll lock your computer down or let someone else know what you've been looking at. Um, again, does not cause it but it, there are relationships to it. Um, and then I've also seen revenge porn and blackmail where you, you know, you're taking a picture consensually with your partner um, and then one of those persons gets mad and decides to break up and now it's on the internet and it, you're not getting it off the internet. So we get those uh, revenge porn or blackmail if someone doesn't participate. So those are some of those risks of producing it and sometimes watching it. Now, what I want to be clear is what porn is not responsible for. <coughs> Again, um, someone, uh, someone was asking me earlier, is, is, is porn good or bad? Uh, porn is just porn. Porn is sexual explicit material. Um, what we do with it, how we interact with it is kind of the issue. So, you know, porn is not responsible for him losing his interest in sexuality. That, that's not a porn issue. It's a couple or marital issue. So I want you to be aware of that. 
you know, if someone comes in saying he compares me to porn actress and activities, again, that's not a porn issue. That's more of a hostility issue. So being able to pull apart what are relationship issues versus porn issues, even if porn is involved and it's a factor. Um, he leaves evidence of masturbating or porn watching around the house. It's, that's a selfishness issue. Um, he makes fun of me or our sex life in a nasty way. That, that's a bullying issue. That's another abuse issue. Um, he blames his porn watching on me. That's, that's an adolescent style of a responsibility um, issue um, or lack of responsibility. And then he'll say he'll stop watching and then I'll catch him doing it. And that's, that's an integrity issue or a trust issue, not technically a porn issue. Again, porn can be evolved. I think Dr. Marty Klein kind of do that, uh, talked about that. So he's a very strong porn advocate. But again, when he's talking about porn, it's the consensual, you know, there are rules in terms of what that would look like rather than just an anything, anything goes and free all. There are, there are some positives. So again, there's lots of potential risks and that goes with anything, I think. So I want you to be aware of this because my job is to try to give you some information so that you can think critically and be, be able to evaluate and, and eliminate those risks of that abuse occurring. Um, there is some positives that have been found in terms of uh, when informed consent. So we have, you know, if the people are watching consensual erotica or, or porn, I guess depending on that's the, the type and stuff like that. So there's some connection that can occur. It can increase bonding and arousal if done appropriately. Um, there's a lot of good, I call it healthy sexual education that looks almost exactly like porn, but it's done from an educational model to teach couples how to have good, passionate, and or loving sex in that system. Um, it's not the stuff that's typically looked at, by the way, <laughs> but it is out there. Um, there are some also women-directed or oriented porn, too, um, which kind of looks at more from a relationship lens. Um, and then, again, there are some for the sex education component. But again, I've had people come in saying, is, you know, that's street porn because you looked on someone on the street and they're wearing a skirt. So that's, that's porn and therefore you've breached a relationship and I'm divorcing you now and had a case actually like that. Um, to, oh, that's not porn. That's just explicit sexual, you know, the child porn, that's porn. That's the bad stuff. So, so they, people will label it sometimes based on what they're wanting and what they can get away with too. So, given all of this information, what can we do about it? Um, now, there are, from a biopsychosocial model, normally I want to look at it to evaluate it. Like, what is the root? What's causing this? Is it from purely biology? You know, are they just hooked on it because they're, they're, you know, their life is generally going pretty good. There is not really any issues. They got a taste of it. They got a taste of it pretty strong. They got into it thinking it wasn't going to be an issue, and now they're, they're hooked into it, and so we're trying to just get them, get them out of that. Um, but it can be from a social model, which is the relationship sucks and therefore this is their outlet they're trying to use. They could be self-medicating due to historical trauma. Those are some of the classic stuff that I'll see. Um, but you can use, like SSRIs have been used to help cool down that arousal response to get people off. Um, some ADHD medications, I've seen them go down. I've also seen that cause them to go up. <laughs> so, like I said, everyone's biology is a little different. Um, had one case where the, there's, it was fascinating. He, you know, uh, he was someone who was having problematic porn use, and the doctor put him on Wellbutrin, which is an anti kind of an antidepressant, but it's a dopamine um, agonist. And so he's saying, what's going on? Because his porn went from seven times a day to about nine or ten times a day. And he's like, this is getting worse. The doctor put me on this meds to kind of fix it. And so when I looked at it, it's a dopamine uptake re-inhibitor, which means the dopamine is in there longer. And so with that, it what makes common sense to me is I can see that affecting the response where the psychiatrist said, no, 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 that's not, not related to it. But well, butrin also from the sex therapist lens is we call it the happy horny drug. So interesting, even within the medical field where it's not consistent in terms of treatment and, and working with stuff like this. Uh, psychologically, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, so that's looking at thoughts and impacting those thoughts to kind of help impact emotions and behavior. Um, mindfulness and behavior therapy, um, and that's setting your structure and setting up consequences and rewards for that. Because um, uh, it's, it's a pretty primal behavior, s sexuality stuff, so sometimes I'm just going straight to behavioral matters to kind of condition it out or to shape it into a, a different manner. But it is, it is hard because it is the strongest reinforcer we have um, that's natural. 
Um, again, looking at the roots. Uh, EMDR for trauma work. Uh, EMDR is probably my main go-to uh, treatment technique that has a really good research backing, which is um, uh, it's quite simple. It's eye movement desensitization reprocessing, but it has a really good response for trauma response. And so if we can cool down some of that old trauma work, sometimes you don't have to self-soothe or self-medicate through porn use, and it increases the likelihood of getting us good results. A um, couple of relational work, uh, that's looking at focusing on the relation and teamwork um, and using that team and support rather than pulling apart and doing your own thing. Um, getting a good social support from your family and or your couple is another thing that a lot of people who use high porn don't feel supported. They don't have that social network and the porn doesn't really help that too much. Um, so support increasing that support system. They've also found that even with heroin users from like uh, Vietnam, that as soon as they had a peer support group and a family system that they got off the heroin relatively quickly compared to those that didn't have that social support and network or a family unit. Um, and then from a social, which is kind of Im impacting their social environment, we're looking at social learning and changing the environment. Um, getting There's some support, support groups. Um, accountability partners and consequences. I tend to spend a lot of time on setting up those accountability partners because then I have to look at reducing that anonymity and access by doing some either porn blockers or computer restrictions that were porn or website trackers. There's tracking software so you can know what people are looking at and we do that consensually in their system so that they're held accountable because if, they, if no one knows what they're doing, there's a higher likelihood of them going to places that they really necessarily shouldn't because what's someone gonna do about it? Unless they get caught on a sting because they went to places that were purposely set up for that. Here are some resources. Um, so there are, there's, there's quite a bit of resources now because it's quite a booming business. Um, apps, so there are computer apps, uh, Ever Accountable. Um, there's Net Nanny, Fortify, Covenant Eyes, Victories, and, and Stop Fap 2, uh, and Rewire Companion are apps that you can put on your phone to block, to track, to kind of inform um, one of your accountability partners what you've been looking at or what. Um, I really like um, some of the websites. Yourbrainonporn.com is a really nice website that has lots of information on the effects of, of porn on your brain and behavior. Uh, TED Talks, there's a few good TED Talks. There was Zimbardo, there's another one who talked a little bit about the effect of high porn use now on adolescent males particularly um, and sexuality. Uh, Nofap.com, uh, X3 Watch. Um, uh, fightthenewdrug.org, so there's some support stuff. There are a lot of online support systems too for, for individuals. Um, and there are some, there's a lot more, uh, I find Christian websites for support. So I, I haven't vetted them, but I'm just letting you know here are some of the main ones that are out there. Um, I think for instance with a lot of, I think the Mormon church um, is really kind of against the porn, porn use. So I have a lot of um, individuals who are trying to get off that um, to kind of stay in line with their religious and or um, spiritual views. And then here's some of the porn blocking apps we have on the right side there. So you can take a picture, snap, or it'll be online. So, And then a few resources. So some of the books. Uh, Patrick Carnes is probably one of the main researchers in terms of looking at kind of that addiction model for a lot of the high porn users or sex addiction issues. Um, in the Shadows of the Net is for porn in particular. Cybersex Unhooked is a workbook, so it's a good workbook. Um, you can even get it online for free because it's out of print, so there's a PDF. <coughs> Facing the Shadow and Out of the Shadows, those are more for the sexual addiction models or out of the control of sexual behavior. Uh, don't Call It Love. Um, Facing Heartbreak um, is kind of for the uh, partner who's, if there's an affair with someone who has uh, out of control sexual behavior. Uh, the Porn Trap. Um, this is one by Wendy Maltz. And then the treating out of control of sexual behavior is kind of, again, that's that other lens, so porn addiction model versus out of control sexual behavior. In the sex therapy community, we're moving into that out of control sexual behavior rather than the addiction model. Again, even though your brain runs like it's an addiction. Um, and then your brain on porn. Now they have a website uh, and, a, and a book that they've created from all that stuff too, which is nice to see. But that is it. So hopefully your head is filled with wonderful things about porn. Yeah, I'll leave it at that one. <laughs> and I guess we're going to start with questions. I was trying to take quick take notes quickly. 
So um, we have about a half an hour that we can continue to have dialogue with Corey. I have put some little bits of paper out. If you might, if you feel like writing down your question, then uh, one of our team will pick it up and I'll read it out so everyone can hear it and so our webcast audience can hear the question too. So invite you to fill out some questions and continue the dialogue. Or if you're really brave, you can ask them personally. Or I can bring you the microphone. <laughs> That's right. So you can put your hand up if you don't feel like writing. Okay, thanks. I don't know a ton personally about today's um, porn, but in a study that I had read... Light on. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know a lot about today's porn, but um, in a study that I read, and I'm sorry, I don't know the year of it, they looked at the most common um, pornography videos, and 88% of them showed violence to women, and then, or degrading behavior to women, and then most of those show that the women either enjoyed it or okay with that. When we talk about good porn, are we talking about that porn, or are we just talking about potentially the other 12%? Uh, I don't know if I have a good answer to that one. I mean, when I'm talking about it, I'm talking about uh, the other 12%. The interesting pattern comes in, though, and I'm going to twist this a little bit. Um, so, for instance, I also deal with a lot of individuals from the kink community. And so it gets into that really gray area of what is what is consensual and active, even though it looks violent, it's consensual, and that still can increase the likelihood for individuals who may not know it, especially if they're kind of running that. Um, so I'd be curious to see, you know, what year that was, because right now, uh, if you really want to know a nice, just yeah, go to Pornhub, um, or at least look at the stats. So Pornhub has a statistical analysis that they do every year on who's watching, where are they watching, how long are they watching, cultural stuff like that, how much of it is violence, how much of this is those lens? I just, to me, oh. the most is violence to women. Wow. Yeah. When I look at that, because I looked at the stats, all I can say is it's mind-blowing because what you're, I don't know if I could even quantify that because there's so many types of porn and I don't know what they've broken that down into because it's, like if you if you just go look at what is now on there, like I think there's oh wow, I'm gonna guess at least a hundred plus different categories, and so in those there could be multi levels of you know how much of that is violence against anyone versus violence against women versus um, violence against trans individuals, you know, you know. So I don't it's a it's a huge area. I, I know in terms of that the non-consensual, I mean, that's that, that's that risky area because just with all the, the higher predictors of individuals in terms of that modeling, looking at that as a standard um, becomes a potential problem, So, which increases that risk for potential abuse and um, taking advantage of individuals. So I don't know if that answers your question. So healthy sex is in part defined as private and porn use can be described in part as isolating um, or at least that's what I gleaned. So I'm just wondering what the difference between the two is and what is lost in making sex private, what is gained um, and I'm just wondering if part of these issues um, come out of the fact that conversations and depictions of healthy sex are kept private? That was like a really loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Try to make sense. Of, so, it's kinda, so I would say as I'm going to expand on that. So I don't, healthy sex does not have to be private. Um, and so I guess it all depends on the, like I said, the infinite number of combinations of sexual behavior that now I see and know of. Um, some of that is consensual public. Um, by both sides, because um, uh, when I'm dealing with, in terms of therapy with couples who are interested in a wide array of different kind of activities, for me I'm looking at, you know, which is different than the porn stuff, because that's kind of, 
produced by someone consensually or not um, in a relationship dynamics it's I'm looking more at what's that navigation going to look like between two consensual adults does it fulfill my requirements of what would be healthy even if it's I call it extreme healthy you know the, like I said some individuals in the kink community engage in extreme behavior in terms of sexual behavior from the continued to the norm but it still fulfills the healthy requirement some of it is not so it's really kind of a case by case that I want to take a peek at so I'm not sure if that answers your question Well, I'm just reading here on this pamphlet. That's where I kind of get this idea. It says healthy sex. Sex is private. But we were describing porn as isolating. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, there is this lack of, um, this lack of exposure to depictions of healthy sex, as you said. Like, there's not a lot of, it's definitely in the minimum, the porn that is showing, like, consent happening. So I'm just wondering if there's something lost in this idea that healthy sex is private. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. I mean, even now, I have individuals who have never talked to anyone about sexuality. The lens of society is still, even though we're, we're leaps ahead where we were 20 years ago, to me, it's still restricted. It's still clamped down. It's still not talked about. And therefore, people aren't comfortable enough talking about it in an open venue because, like, a lot of people are doing it <laughs> in any way, be it watching, be it engaging, being it, you know, self-sexuality, stuff like that. Part of my job is to come out and educate people to say, talk about it. I mean, because you can't learn, you can't do it, and we get more problems when we hide. When we look at the Victorian era, it got suppressed, crunched down. Did it stop? Oh, no. It just got more interesting and hidden and, you know, went into the little crawl spaces, and then it became more of a problem. Um, and so the more we've come out with it, you'll get this little bit of a rebound typically because people go, oh, new toy. It moves and then it kind of tends to kind of come balanced, a more healthy balance the more we get it out there. But uh, right now, we're fighting kind of, you know, more conservative lenses from that. And, and that's going to be some of that difficulty in getting that out there. And, and even defining what is healthy sexuality is kind of know chunked into different you know spiritual lenses belief systems about what is okay what is not okay within the church without a church you know so it's I, I laugh when I did my sex you know my sexuality training my intro sexuality textbook is just as big as my if not bigger than my intro psychology textbook and each chapter ha you know it's just it's it's a huge area once you kind of get your head into it um, but it's still not talked about anywhere enough I think I sorry I was gonna add one more I was in the States and they were doing sex offender treatment program stuff and federally and when I, I was having a bit of a fit because I said what do you guys do for working with you know teaching the sexuality stuff for your sex offenders it's like oh no no we don't talk about sex it's like this is a federally funded program in the US for sex offenders and you will never mention in their treatment time while they're incarcerated anything about sex not teaching healthy sex nothing about sex it's relapse prevention avoid the topic I lost it. I said, can you tell I'm Canadian? Because it was just a, it was just a bizarre experience that I couldn't wrap my head around, even culturally. So yeah. I learned in my human sexuality classes that CBT has also been used for like homosexual people and asexual people and pedophiles and it hasn't been that effective. So how effective is it for th this case? Okay. So what I, what I kind of heard is that people have used CBT for homosexual behavior, pedophilia, and asexuality. <sighs> okay, so I would say as general feel thoughts in terms of what is, so homosexuality is viewed more as, uh, I'm blocking on the word, homosexuality is a, oh come on, so it's, it's not a behavior per se, it can be a behavior, it's your um, identity or it's, a, it's kind of more of a hardwired system. Um, and again, when I look at homosexuality, I look at it's not a black, white, and kind of it's on that continuum because we all tend to be on a continuum, uh, Kinsey scale, if you're looking for, between kind of 
heterosexual to homosexual sexual behavior and mindset. So that that homosexual right now in Canada it is illegal to do conversion therapy to convert someone from homosexual to not homosexual or to change those behaviors. If they're wanting to stop that behavior or that mindset, really hard. So I would say as you know, unless now here's where you get a little qualifier. Can you learn to include same-sex sexual behavior based on your previous sexual experiences or, or trauma? Yes. So that's the difference between being gay and saying as, I'm okay with engaging in same-sex sexual behavior because I got used to it when I was growing up because this abuse happened to me. And, and so that's when I'm really looking at that biopsychosocial model is I need to go back to the root to say, how'd this happen? What is it? Is it a learned behavior? Is it a a biological predisposition? Is it both? Pull that apart and what does a person want to change and why? Um, for the PED stuff, if it's true PED, no, I haven't seen that at all. If it's learned a, a learned sexual arousal template that has occurred because of those learnings, then we can do some modifications and changing of that, but it also depends on what age it is. If it happens during their uh, 12 to 14 year old range and it's locked in uh, it's a lot harder so there's lots of little complications within there um, there was two did I get all three asexuality ah, another one so that's another controversial topic of course we're talking about all the controversial topics here um, asexuality is kind of another similar system so I've seen <coughs> To me, I believe there is asexuality, but I also see a lot of individuals who say they are asexual when they don't fulfill that classic criteria for asexuality means a non-sexual. So it can be non-sexual up here or non-sexual behavior. I have some individuals say they're, I'm, I'm asexual, but I masturbate daily. So to me, that doesn't fulfill the requirement of asexual. Or I don't want to have sex with someone else, um, or I don't have any desire but I still engage in sexual behavior. Does it give pleasure? Yes, but I, so that's where that complication occurs is what's causing that because we're all hardwired that, to have pleasure regarding sexual behavior. If that's not working, I wanna kinda go back to say, is, is this because you've been traumatized? Is this because you just want to take on that label? Is this because you're truly asexual and things just aren't working the way they normally would with an individual? Is it by choice? So, uh, I have to, I need to rip it down to find out what's causing it for me to be able to, to do the magic or to help change behavior if that's what's wanted. Okay. Using, C is using CBT to change uh, homosexuality, asexuality, and pedophilia, how effective is it? So, big complicated question, <laughs> but yeah. Hi there. Um, I have a question about uh, from your presentation. I found that it's very similar to self-harming behaviors, and I'm just wondering: Have you, from your research, from your time of working in in the field, have you seen that there's a correlation with the self-harm be self-harm behavior and the uh, pornography use? Because um, in my mind that it's from what i know from self-harming it's more about emotional regulations and and like cell smoothing and stuff and and from from your i would say although i can't tell exactly the correlation i would say as in my experience and, and the stuff there's a direct correlation i don't know how high but that self-soothing behavior from the hit kind of gets the same thing if you're self-harming and cutting because you're getting that endorphin hit um Except I think I see a lot more of my porn users and self-medicating through masturbation because it's more pleasurable and you don't get the, you can hide it better. <laughs> um, but I'll see more of the self-harming behavior with my girls versus, you know, my guys who tend to use this one. Uh, but yeah, to me there's, it's, a, it's commonly more of a coping mechanism where it starts and that numbing and then having to deal with the world or the, or the circumstances, you can actually desensitize or yeah, sensitize yourself not desensitize by watching a lot of porn you can actually sensitize yourself to real life relationships which makes it more emotionally uncomfortable so you just go back to the safety of porn because it's much easier and you don't have to worry about anyone else's feelings so that's the other common thing I'll see is dealing with someone else's feelings for some of my um, porn users is just 
strong. It's too strong for them to handle. And they're thinking they have to worry about what the other person wants. Porn is easy. Could you talk a little about the difference between uh, street level exploitation and difference or similarity um, in what you talked about today and maybe the causes, um, correlations, impacts, influencing factors, you might have drug influencing factors in there. Just so not exploitation but not involving online internet um, youth exploiting on the street that are just not they're not using online platforms um, and the role of no full full on exploiting Am I been I'm just wondering, yes, if you could explain a little bit more, and I, I'm glad you're asking the question because I wanted to take us into talking a I, I don't know if I, I can, but it, when you're talking about uh, full-on exploiting youth on the street, more street involved rather than online involved, and when you're talking about full-on uh, exploiting, if you could just say a little bit more about that, that might help us selling themselves for sex okay so youth selling themselves for sex and um, I'm just so you want to know about why the youth might be selling themselves for sex well, well, no, but just the difference between online versus not online and if you're seeing I might look to some of the folks who are working more directly with youth than I am to see if you might be able to help us understand. Yeah, just a second. Well, your presentation is specifically about pornography. And are you thinking along the lines, is there a correlation or a direct cause with the with the uh, use of pornography leading to youth exploitation? I, I would think your answer would stand the same with what you've presented this afternoon, that there may be a correlation, but not a direct cause. There's individuals who have a history of sexual abuse, which is already one of the high statistics, not only to uh, higher porn use, but in terms of you know selling self for sexual behavior. Or, um, so, the cases that I've had where you know I was already abused, so then we go into you know street work, and from that street work, it's like wow, like someone's giving me more money, and I get a cut. Why not? And so there's that sense of. It's already kind of happening. It's no different than it's already happening, so why not make money off of it? I've had a few of those cases, um, but I'd say the correlation is probably very similar as it's just a, a step in, in a way towards that, potentially. But in Canada, we don't have a lot of production value, I think. It's more, you know, you go down to California, where it's, you know, or Europe has a high rate. Um, I think India also has a high rate of uh, porn production. I just wonder if, if you have any comments from Human Trafficking and Exploitation Unit, anything that you're seeing with youth um, either exploiting themselves through providing sex or being exploited that might help us understand. It'll be interesting to see how this case that I referred to of the, the couple who, you know, one of the charges is uh, making child pornography. But that'll be interesting to see how that works its, its way through the, the court and what comes out there. Youth will often find themselves in a situation where 
Um, they may have allowed a partner to take pictures. They may have agreed to take pictures for the exchange of money. Like we see that sometimes with our youth, but it, uh, the actual production of the kind of pornographic material you're talking about is not, a co would you say, Colin, not very common with sexually exploited youth. It's, it's more the sex act in exchange for something. In my cases of sexual abuse or incest, where it's you know the videos are made in home for the home, occasionally they may be sold out um, to private individuals after that. But that's the only cases that I've dealt with forensically. So, when Corey and I were talking about the session, uh, he made a comment to me that. Uh, he's now working with young, pr primarily boys, I think, who were exposed to viewing sex, who then became perpetrators. So he was well working with them as offenders, where they, and I, I, I just, well, I was surprised and shocked. And so I just wondered if you might help us understand the dynamic of viewing and then becoming an offender, and then how you work with those young boys to help them heal and stop that behavior of harming other young people? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll comment. Yeah, there's, uh, it's almost like circles. Like I talked about the root. I have one, you know, some cases where I, I don't think the behavior is going to stop. There's a high impulsivity. There's, there's a knowledge that you're not supposed to be doing this. It's illegal. You're getting into trouble. Yeah, it's been a year. It's not. Ch it's not changing. It's not changing at all. Um, a lot of the individual, particularly with my boys, it, it's that once you get caught that first time, that drops that that likelihood of recidivism because they got scared enough from that, and the, you know, police involvement became present, and so they it shocks them out of it enough to get them out of that hook um, because they're much more aware of the potential consequences. So um, sometimes it's not too hard for my. I'm just kind of, you know, making sure I'm securing everything and, you know, getting the family online so that we can make protect. But other times, it, it, I'm like, I, I, there's not a thing I can even do um, outside of putting them on high medications to drop that down. And I don't even know if that's necessarily going to work. So it's sometimes it's a challenge. Thanks. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, earlier you were mentioning statistics that get released by Pornhub. It's been a while since I've looked at those statistics, but it reminded me of one time when I looked at them and I found statistics about the type of pornography that women are accessing on Pornhub. And those statistics showed that women were accessing a lot of like the really violent stuff that we were talking about earlier, which seems to throw a bit of a stone, I suppose, at a the conventional wisdom of women being a lot more oriented towards romance when it comes to arousal. So I think when we kind of like have that conversation, there's probably a lot of nuance being left out of that. So I'm really curious as to your thoughts about the interplay between those statistics about what women seem to be accessing in porn and it's kind of like being oriented towards romance thing. I definitely have my opinions from my experience. So maybe I'll Maybe I'll just speak from my experience rather than my opinion, because <laughs> uh, someone's going to have a problem with it no matter what. Um, there is an interesting dynamic when we're looking at some of the historical desire patterns or arousal templates. So I'd say as if I'm going to generalize, the common pattern I'll see is fr from a core perspective, I'd say as clinically about 80% of my women run my traditional intimacy base um, romance kind of model with some modifications. That's why Fifty Shades of Grey is actually more powerful or more popular in soul more books than Harry Potter combined. Why is that? Because there is also an, uh, that little thing that a lot of people don't want to talk about, and I see it a lot in my, uh, is I call it the consensual um, hunting and taking. So they don't want, there's not that, the abuse lump, but it looks <laughs> uh, predatory, but it's purely consensual with someone that's in an intimate relationship. So it, that's where we get into that interesting 
arousal template that is commonly seen. And I'm curious how much of that might be bioevolutionary for some reason. But it is a common pattern um, in terms of that you know, an alpha male. There's a lot of high power, um, you know, high status, high power, high financial, financial stuff in terms of who women will find attractive. And so sometimes you're going to have a higher rate of that. So I'm, I'm more curious about it, but I see it a lot. Um, but a lot of women don't talk about it until they come into session with me and they go, oh, by the way, here's really what I'm into. And because we hit this, here's the other one, I call it the sensitive 90s guy. So back in the 90s, my women were saying, we want the sensitive 90s guy. They're so wonderful, the relationship. And when they got him, they said, the relationship is so wonderful. He's so sweet. Ugh, sex, ugh. like, I do not want to look at him. I just, what's wrong? What's wrong with me? And so that's where that part comes in. And as soon as we got the bad boy, because there's a, in, in psych principle, there's a Madonna who are in the good boy, bad boy kind of dynamic. So you marry the good boy, you want to sleep with the bad boy. You marry the Madonna, you want to sleep with the whore because it's exciting, you can do whatever you want. It's risky, it's exciting versus consistent, reliable. And so you want a healthy balance of those within a healthy system that's consensual. But it doesn't look always appropriate. So that's what I see in the clinic in a session that I, you know, repeatedly over and over and over. Um, but there's been a demasculinization of men, which a lot of my women are complaining about, because you want both, <laughs> but they don't work so well in the bedroom compared to the relationship. And so it's, it's crafting every individual's preferred recipe <laughs> in a consensual system so that works in a healthy model. So that's what I find that I have to spend a lot more time with. If that answers your question. But again, a lot of people don't like talking about that. <laughs> well, that's one reason why we're having this session today is to be able to, again, open up these difficult conversa conversations about complex uh, challenges uh, of being human beings and living, working, uh, relating together. I would just like to add a couple of of things in from my experience facilitating the sex trade offender program and the some of the calls that I get uh, after the arrests, uh, you know, whether the police are arresting on the street or uh, what we call online stings. So one call was, thank God I got arrested. I know I'm struggling with out of control behavior. Is this program going to help me? What can I do? I, I don't want to wait two months to get to the sex trade offender program. So I said, well, I will package you up, all the material we have, and I would encourage you to uh, call Corey. Uh, and those are things that you can do. Uh, another man actually uh, was arrested, came to the program, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about a lot of these issues during, during that uh, day and talk about impact on self and on others in you're in relationship with. And then he was arrested again two months later and he called me, what's going to happen to me now? So I said, well, let's talk a little bit more. Why do you think you went back out, uh, you know, well, he actually was arrested online. He said, well, you know, I grew up, my father made me watch pornography, so it's been in me since I was a child. Um, I was really just uh, I, curious. My wife and family were away. I thought I could deal with this on my own. He was a man of the uh, uh, Muslim faith. He said, so I went and I talked to my imam. But then at 2 o'clock at night, he, again, everything over, came over me again, and I... I started going online and seeing who I might talk to. So he's, he was naming that he had a deeper challenge. So again, I said, well, one, one pathway out is to, you know, is to go and talk to someone. In addition to uh, working through it spiritually with your imam, you might want to talk with someone who can help you unpack the, uh, those deeper issues for yourself. Because the next time you get arrested, it will be even more serious. And I said, I don't know what's going to happen to you, you know, with the second time arrest. He may well have a, a guilty conviction. Another young man's been calling uh, our office, uh, and he gave us insights that we never had before. He was a young man uh, traveling in California, ran out of money, and um, was approached to become a porn star. So he thought, okay, sure, you know, get paid for having sex. Uh, what's wrong with that? Or not what's wrong with that, but will that, how will that harm me? So it started out pretty 
kind of fun and, and glamorous. But the more he got into it, then he and his, uh, his partner were dealing with weekly diagnoses of sexually transmitted infections in various aspects parts of their body and then their relationship began to break up and he's actually what I would say he's in a loop right now he keeps repeating all these terrible things that have happened to him every phone call that he makes to us and we do keep, in keep encouraging him to maybe talk to a psychologist because we're not uh, but he's, he's trapped in some loop that uh, is problematic to him and that he doesn't know how to get out of. The other things that we, we hear are the stories of children who were exposed um, to pornography and became highly sexualized in their, uh, in their behaviors and then became uh, easy to prey upon and pull into uh, the sex trade and sexual exploitation. And we also hear about, again, boys who were exposed to pornography then uh, you know, then uh, molesting girls at day, you know, three-year-olds at daycare, and then that, that just so starts a whole negative and challenging ripple, both for the seven-year-old boy who'd been exposed to pornography, who then molested the three-year-old girl. Both of them began, you know, a path of uh, that led them into self-harm and then into the sex trade. In some of my searching for how to educate men and, and uh, what to show them at the Sex Trade Offender Program. I found videos from every spiritual tradition. He talked about the evangelical Christian tradition, and there was the, the, the non-religious, there was uh, a guru from India, there were imams. Uh, so it tells me that when there's all these YouTube videos that many people are finding overuse of pornography or sexually violent and degrading images a big challenge and that's one reason why we wanted to just again crack it open today for more thought and to see especially are there things that we can do to help our children uh, in their health and development um, so we have one more question and then we're going to wrap up because we're at 1 30. So I'm just wondering about um, with when you're treating and you know treating people around sexual out of control sexual behavior um, about TV and particularly media because of, as I age I see a, a lot more than I certainly saw when I was a kid and I just see uh, kids being a any show has a lot of uh, sexual behavior healthy unhealthy I'm not certain but but I'm wondering what you do around that. Do you have people not watch TV as much, or do you ask them to pick particular shows, or just curious about how media is affecting your work? And I know that's a really big question at the end of the day. <laughs> I have an issue with too much media, period, just in the effect of brains and kids anyway. So we're trying to manage that. I spend more time educating because I know that you're not going to get away from the media and, and what's going to be out there because like I said, sex tells you're going to see it. What I want to do is I want people to be well informed enough so that's part of this venue so that you know, here are some of the side effects. When you start seeing some of that problematic behavior, here's what it's about. This is a natural desire. This is a na how do we now talk about it, keep it open because there's still a huge stigma attached to it even for the, you know, the porn users who, or I have a lot of, who do you do if, you're, if your porn preference is underage children? Who do you talk to? Nobody. So it's illegal and you get this whole process and so there's that stigma attached to that or if you have special interests that are outside of the norm. We're just talking, I mean, base porn, but like I said, there's anything you're looking for, you can find it. And so I'm looking at uh, education is probably my most important component, you know, restricting certain access. Um, but it's also, you know, at what age do we looking at to teach them about you know, here's what the problem is, here's, so use it as an opportunity. You're not going to get rid of it. What is healthy, what is not healthy, how is that impacting? Make sure the parents are having a good discussion with those children about what's going on there. That can be okay. This is just a you know, depiction of that, as long as it's age appropriate, give or take, you know, because there's, you're going to see a wide range of stuff within a show that's on prime time where kids can see. But for me, as the, the education component is going to be the most critical in terms of keeping that open discussion and teaching and, and, and making sure people are safe and well-informed and, and can come to you and talk about it. 
uh, one piece of information. There's there's a new, uh, I just got on involved with them probably a, a month ago. It's called Pineapple. So these are for individuals who are involved in the adult film industry and any of those. They actually provide counseling and they will pay for a portion of it um, or all of it depending on. It was primarily in the States and UK. Um, it's really brand new in Canada. I, might, I think I'm the only one in Alberta who got on that one. Um, but so that's, that's another one. Uh, Pineapple is what it's called, pineapple something, .uk, pineapple.com, um, and that's for counseling services. This is a new resource that I thought, so other than that, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Corey. And thank you all for coming out to bravely confront, as I said, this very complex uh, human issue. And I think your your you know last few words are on educate, talk about it. You know, let's let's crack it open so that we can um, encourage health rather than uh, harm. And with that, we'll draw this to a conclusion. It will be up on the Reach Edmonton YouTube website in about a month. So if you didn't get a chance to write down all the notes uh, or want to re-listen, you can do that or let, uh, let other colleagues know that it's available. And on behalf of the Sexual Exploitation Working Group, I want to thank you all. And stay tuned. Join the Reach Edmonton um, email list because that's where you'll find out about all sorts of learning opportunities. Thank you.